some of the statistical examples, some things which, some geometrical insights, which certainly make me understand what's going on, help me understand what's going on, and some concluding remarks. I'm leaving out nearly all the mathematics, which is supposed to be in a completely different paper, um, and uh, concentrating on trying to understand the problem. Minimum distance estimation, fairly obviously. Hardy-Weinberg estimation, I will bring that up in a moment. Um, updating the Alscal algorithm and uh, actually gives you the transformation T, doesn't prove that it's correct, but tells you that if you just expand it, you'll find it does what we say it does. And I then go on to say, if only we could measure how much money has been saved and how many false trails avoided by using good design. And I have no doubt that experimental design is Fisher's greatest legacy to applied statistics. You've had a long and fruitful career in statistical methods which uh, really fall under the area of what we call classification. So how did this all start? Well, first of all, it's very nice to be here. Thank you. Um, how did it start? Uh, it started in 1955 um, when I went to Rosenstead. Um, they'd acquired a computer in 1954 um, and I think this was the first computer to be devoted entirely to the analysis of biometric type data. Um, Frank Yates, of course, was the head of the department then, and uh, he had been told he could have this computer for nothing, um, just to investigate whether uh, computing machinery was of any use to statisticians. So the work was broadly divided into two parts, routine analyses, which was part of the Department's bread and butter, and something which Frank set up called the Statistical Research Service. Uh, the bread and butter part was writing programs to analyse experiments, do regression, um, fit curves, you name it, all that sort of thing, probit analysis. Um, and of course, there was absolutely nothing available then. You had to write your own subroutines for division and square roots and to read in a number and to print out a number. Uh, things are not as they are today. But the interesting thing was the Statistical Research Service. And this encouraged people from all over the United Kingdom um, who had uh, a problem which might need a computer and might very broadly be classed as being in the biometric area. Um, Frank wasn't very fussy uh, to stick rigidly to the rules and say, I'm sorry, we can't do this because it's not biometric enough. Um, now, one of the things that came my way was that uh, Peter Smith uh, had written a paper in the Journal of General Microbiology on uh, numerical classification of uh, microbes, of course. And Margaret Pleasance, who worked in the Low Temperature Research Laboratory at Cambridge, had read this. I should say low temperature here means food low temperature, not physics low temperature. Um, and was, she came and asked whether it was possible to do something similar. For her, she had some group of bacteria. I think it was lactobacilli. And um, she wanted to see if they could be classified numerically. And this is something that I did. Uh, it all went well, and other people heard it had been done, and I began to get people from all over interested in doing numerical taxonomy, um, basically the single linkage method. Uh, um, a lot of clients came from the British Museum of Natural History, some from Oxford, um, certainly one from Uppsala, uh, uh, Southampton, all over the country and they all had groups of organisms they would like to classify. And of course they all had different kinds of measurement, so I rather rapidly decided for self-defense I would have to write a program which coped with all kinds of different kinds of medicine, uh, med uh, uh, measurements, and um, uh, 
So I invented a, a general coefficient of similarity to do all this. Now this was of course in the 1950s and things were different then. Um, my clients published papers. I didn't feel I had done enough to include my name on them. Um, and they said that, that's all very well, but we want to refer to something. And I said, well, I don't know if I can write anything that's important enough, worthy of a paper. And eventually I did, when I had discovered some properties of the general coefficients, um, Euclidean properties, embedding properties, uh, positive definiteness and things of this kind. And I sent a paper to Biometrics, which was, I think, published about three years later. And I can't remember why the, why the delay. I don't think it was any serious problem. It was just that times were more leisurely then. And this paper was, of course, referred to by, by many people. Uh, now, at the same time, this wasn't my work initially, uh, a problem came into being in the uh, Statistical Research Service of trying to identify fossil apes' teeth. Um, whether they were more human or more ape-like. And Michael Healy, uh, Steve Lipton and Frank Yates got involved in doing a canonical analysis on this. The problem was that earlier people had done lots of t-tests, uh, which was not a very satisfactory approach. So they thought they'd try a canonical analysis, which of course meant the writing all the matrix inverse programs, all the uh, eigenvalue programs, uh, Tuleski decomposition, sort of anything to do with matrix algebra had to be written by people in the department. I got involved in some of that. Um, but I didn't know anything about um, canonical analysis and was not involved in this project. Until uh, a year or so later, uh, a visitor from Italy came and he was interested in doing canonical analysis with alpha alpha. Uh, <clears throat> and this was fine, Michael Healy was going to hold his hand in doing this, but Mike Healy decided he would go off to Bell, Bell Telephone Laboratories for six months. And he s said to me, well, you can look after this. And it was a blind leading the blind, but that's how I learnt about um, canonical analysis. I should point out here that perhaps I've always regarded it as a great advantage that nobody ever tried to teach me any multivariate analysis. <laughs> it's been a great handicap to uh, have had other people's ideas imposed upon me at that yes. stage. Um, anyway, uh, so canonical analysis came in, in there and I realised, of course, here was distance again, these, dissim these dissimilarity coefficients uh, what became Euclidean embeddable distances. We had Mahalanobis distance. We said, ha ha ha, you know, there's something in common in all this. Um, and then a third strand, again due to the Statistical Research Service, came from uh, Williams, Professor Williams, W.T. Williams, in the University of Southampton, where he was Professor of Botany. Uh, and he and Godfrey Lance, who was head of the computing lab down there, um, had been doing some initial numerical work. Uh, Williams had a coefficient of association um, for quadrats, ecological uh, presence and absence of species in quadrats and he did a kind of two by two chi-squared statistics statistic this is his coefficient of association and he found if he put it into a matrix lots of quadrats found his eigenvalues as if you were doing a principal component analysis and drew out the first two dimensions he would get something very sensible uh, why um, was it was a big question. Hmm. Well, eventually it did come to me that the reason, what the reason why was. And perhaps I should mention that it happened not whilst I was sitting at my desk, but whilst the dance was going on at Romsfred Manor and I had nothing better to do. <laughs> and I thought, well, let's try and solve this problem. <laughs> and suddenly uh, it all dawned on me. I saw the light and of course I need to get a bit of pencil and paper to write the algebra down. <laughs> that was and the secondary. Yeah. And that's how I became interested in uh, what I call principal coordinates analysis, mm -hmm. which is the same as classical scaling. 
and I wrote that up biometrica. Michael Healy by then had returned from America and where he'd met Joe Kruskal at the Bell Telephone Labs and he mentioned to me there's all this non-metric scaling going on I got interested in that too so multidimensional scaling came into my purview as it were uh, um, and all these things were based on distance in some form or another. I've been doing work on this, of this kind for the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that came out of, uh, was your time at Rothamsted and uh, yeah. your, uh, your time there spanned this whole uh, birth and development of statistical computing. Oh yeah. You showed us some pictures of Fisher and Yates working at this oh, yes, computer they. called the Millionaire. Yeah, the Millionaire. <laughs> well, the Millionaire goes back to 1920 or thereabouts. That was an electromechanical yeah. thing. And statisticians have always been um, closely associated with their computing. Uh, uh, famous pictures of Carl Pearson at the Bruns of Eager, mm -hmm. uh, turning the handle, and uh, Fisher at his millionaire. Mm -hmm. I think I said the other day, yeah. one of Fisher's remarks was, I learnt all my, I learnt all my statistics at the computer. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And Frank Yates uh, moved on to his first electronic computer and um, developed a lot of ideas there which have um, extended that they've grown eventually into things like GenStat and uh, generalized linear models and things of this kind which were developed by John Nelder of course but primitive versions of these things were actually going on the on the original machine mm -hmm. uh, which was a very small machine you couldn't really do things very mm -hmm. very seriously on it. You still be going to many conferences and giving many talks on uh, multi-dimensional uh, methods and, and graphics and that how do you think about the subject today and uh, how it's going to carry on? Well, my own interests developed into uh, bi-plots um, and Procrustes analysis and generalized canonical forms and analysis of skew symmetry and, and things of that kind. Uh, now, when I'm asked how I think things will develop, I am very cautious mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, I know too many examples where people have foretold the future. <laughs> uh, Morris Kendall wrote a, a, a paper as president of the Royal Statistical Society, um, the next 25 years of statistics, I think, and uh, 25 years later he wrote another one because all his prophecies of the first one were wrong. Um, John Tukey's The Future of Data Analysis, mm. I don't think it was spot on. Uh, I'm minded of um, Hartree, who was the first professor of computing at Cambridge, who thought that two EDSAC computers, very primitive computers, would be enough for all the scientific needs of the country <laughs> for the foretellable future. Mm. And I'm not sure if it was Edison or, or, um, or Bell who in the 19th century said he could confidently, confidently foretell the day when every major American city would have a telephone. <laughs> um, so, great men foretelling the future have not been very successful. Um, what I do know is that statistics has always developed out of problems of the day. Hmm. And problems will continue, new types of measurement, new fields hmm. of science, um, physical sciences, genetics of course, um, social sciences, all these areas will throw up new problems and statisticians um, will respond to them mm. and develop new ideas. Mm. What they will be I would not attempt to <laughs> forecast. <laughs> okay, well thanks very much and thanks for coming to Barcelona again and uh, coming up for this weekend. I think I'm just going to step outside. If you'd like to come outside, we just show the people where we are. Because okay.